Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Jimmy Duster Music Channel. I'm Jimmy Duster, and uh, joining me for a new show that we're going to start having here on a, on a weekly basis is my friend from Seattle, the incorrigible Ludite. Ludite. Sorry, I pronounced it wrong there. That's all right. Uh, it, this new show we're, we're calling uh, A Week With. And the first week, what we're, we intend to do is, is choose like a, a, an artist that maybe we're both familiar with, maybe we're not familiar with, not overly familiar with, or maybe you are and I'm not, or vice versa. But uh, just spend a week with their catalog and get through as much of it as we can, and then uh, gather here once a week and kind of give our insights to each other. We've known each other for 100 years, I think, and... And yeah, I actually sure. some of, some of my um, affinity for this kind of stuff actually evolved with you because I remember specifically when you were in Middlesbrough at your mom's house. Uh -huh. and this would have been like 1988 or 89. You had yeah. these big encyclopedias of music. Like, yeah. Kind of what you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And you would go into this stuff and you would show me this stuff. And at the time, I was a Zeppelin. I, I was a Zeppelin. You know this. I was a Zeppelin fanatic in 1988. And I would like be looking at this stuff and I would look at this stuff and I would, oh, folk rock, they're folk rock, they're art rock, they're heavy blues, they're hard rock, they're proto metal, you know, and it would give like all these little descriptions of what they did. So you are part of my curse. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. we're, we're starting this week with a, a group that we've both been familiar with for some time. Uh, Kansas. Uh, we do have some shows coming up in the future. We've already talked about doing a Doors episode uh, next week, and we've talked about a, um, um, a 1988 album battle of the progressive metal concept albums uh, between Iron Maiden's Somewhere in Time and Queensryche's Operation Mindcrime, correct? Great topic. That's a great topic. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of our friends would appreciate that. And a lot of people would appreciate that because, uh, I mean, Iron Maiden's a very revered band. And most people would consider that Queensryche's best album. So I think that's a very fair, very fair battle. Yep, yep. And uh, we'll get started with Kansas here today. You know, a, a band that we were both, I think, a little familiar with. I know I was a little familiar with. And you'll hear when... when um, a little bit later, how it was one of the first, a Kansas album was one of the first albums I ever purchased with my own money. Um, but, you know, kind of didn't know them for a few years. I, I mean, I knew their hits, but never really explored the catalog. So this has this been an interesting week for me. Hopefully it has for you, too. Yeah, it, uh, it was mainly last weekend when I, I did like a 12-hour, 14-hour Kansas marathon and, you know, I'm not kidding, man. I was like kind of burned out on Kansas. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. And <laughs> at midnight, I chased it with Juju by Susie and the Banshees. I had no choice. So, <laughs> you know, um, it was interesting. I learned a lot of things that I did not know about Kansas. And I'll get into that, I guess, before I really go into it and how I first heard their music and whatnot. Yeah, well, Mr. Luddite, why don't you uh, kick us off here and spend some time just talking about uh, your experience with Kansas, your experience over the past week here in their catalog, maybe pick out a few of your, your favorite uh, parts of their catalog or, or pieces out of their catalog, and you know, let us know mainly anything, because we want to put this out there for collectors too, so anything maybe you have in your collection or don't have, but you're like, hey, you know what, I should probably add this to my collection. If I, okay. if I find it somewhere, so. Well, let, let me start with there, Mr. Luddite. Okay, here we go. Um, first of all, I have no Kansas to show you. Um, I have no physical media from Kansas. Um, I don't have any CDs. I don't have any vinyl. Kansas, to me, um, you were probably more familiar with them than I was before we did this, but certainly the song from childhood that I remember the most, and I can remember when I first heard it was Dust in the Wind, and of course that is their biggest and best known song. And after really digesting their catalog to the best of my ability, I think it is their best song. Um, but I remember vividly um, being in my mom's car in like 1977 on Livingston Avenue, going 
towards No Bixby Road and hearing this song on the radio. And it was kind of like, I really like this song, you know. There was like all this ambrosia and stuff like that in the radio. And then the song comes on and there was something very profound about it. I didn't know what the word profound meant then, but as I look back on it now, the song is very existential. Um, you know, the lyrics are very existential. It's a great song. And after digesting their catalog, it is my favorite Kansas song. And I, I guess that's really not a good thing when your favorite song by a band is their most popular song. But in the case of Kansas, that is indeed the case. But I remember, you know, in the car with my mom going down the road hearing this song, like maybe after an Ambrosia song or something like that came on. And it immediately gripped me as being deep. There was something very deep about it. Like it was somber. It was sad. You know, now I would say existential. But anyway, let me go into the catalog and go into what I found, starting with the first record. Uh, that was my introduction, being in my mom's car, circa 1977, wondering, what are these lyrics all about? This is interesting, and it's it's kind of deep. I get this. Let's start with the first record. Kansas, Kansas from 1974. And I'm using notes here, of course, because I wasn't very familiar with the catalog. So if you folks see me looking to the right a little bit, I'm looking at my notes. I won't lie. The first record, um, it really – I was surprised by how much of a southern rock influence it had. Um, I didn't really know that about Kansas at all. I didn't look at Wikipedia or anything like that, you know, other than to get the album titles. But there was like a really heavy Allman Brothers influence on this record, I thought. Um, some Blue Oyster Call influence, who's obviously not a Southern rock band, but they're pretty straightforward. But you, know, you hear that Genesis influence, the early Genesis influence from the very first record. It is the, the probably the most prominent influence they have on all their records, even though – they do have kind of an Americana sound that they incorporate the Genesis elements with. I did not like the first record that much, but there was one track that did stand out for me, and it was called Belexus. My apologies to Kansas fans who might be listening to this. I don't know how to pronounce that. I like Belexus quite a bit. I think it was an average debut, but Belexus was a great song, and it had kind of like a Moby Dick, John Bonham-style drum solo that I really appreciated. I liked that. Um, it was a kind of a hard rocking song, it was one of the less progressive songs of the record in terms of going in that direction, and I liked it. Now, let's go on to the next record, uh, Song for America, 19. I, I thought the debut was, was kind of a, an average debut. Let's go on for Song for America, the second record. Well, first of all, I like the album cover on Song for America a way more. I did not like the cover, by the way, on the debut record. It, I didn't get it. Song for America, much better album cover. Let's go over it. This, this record was a little better than the debut. It was good, okay, but not... Great, good. Uh, the one song that really stood out that I didn't like was the title track, uh, Song for America. It sounded like Too Close to Firth of Fifth by Genesis, to be completely honest, uh, the piano parts on it. Um, the Lonely Street probably was my favorite song on the record, and it really wasn't a proggy song. It was kind of a heavy blues hard rocker, and I think it was the best track on the record. Um I kind of liked In You Owe Him to the Atman. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I liked the guitar work on that track. Um, those were probably the the two best tracks in the record. Another track I noticed was, uh, oh, um, yeah, I, I think it was In You Owe Him to, to the Atman. Uh, it kind of reminded me of Giorgio Moroder production like on the cat people soundtrack but overall better than the debut a little prog gear a little less southern rock influence uh let's go on to mask from 1975 uh, i would say this is about the same as the second record um not any better not any worse um you still hear like the allman brothers kind of style kind of blended with the genesis early progressive genesis style um the best song on this record for me was definitely mysteries and mayhem I like this one. Good hard rocker. Uh, I feel like that riff on this song was used by someone else later. I just couldn't put a finger on who. But I like this album. Um, about the same as Song for America. Both good, both better than the debut. Now we get into the popular stuff on Left Overture in 1976. Uh, and this is where I, I got to admit, I think their popular stuff is their best stuff. And that's usually not the case with bands that I really love. But in the case of Kansas, I think that is the case. Um, 
Left Overture's got their second most famous song, Carry On My Wayward Son. Very good song. Not great for me, but very good. Big arena rocker. Pretty hard rocking track. I like it. Um, some of the other tracks that I thought were pretty good on this record were uh, Miracles Out of Nowhere. Um, Cheyenne Anthem. I did like that one. Uh, it actually sounded a lot like an early Genesis song. And it's interesting to note on Left Overture, the Southern rock influence is becoming less pronounced, clearly. Still there a little bit, but not like it was on those first three records. Magnum Opus, second best track on the record. Very progressive song. Uh, it's probably the most musical thing on the album. Very progressive. We move on to Point of No Return in 1977. Um, probably like Left Overture a little more as a record overall. Uh, but I think Left Overture and Point of No Return are both pretty good records. They're not masterpieces for me, but they're both pretty good. Uh, this has got dust in the wind on it. It is the best song on the record. It is the best song on the entire catalog for me. Uh, interesting, uh, a song on this record called Portrait He Knew. The beginning bass line on that sound it sounds a lot like Back in New York City by Genesis on the Liam Lies Down on Broadway. Again, I couldn't help but notice it. Uh, I did like the track six. It's called Lightning's Hand. Very good track, a bit like Queen, kind of a rocker in the Queen kind of a vein. I like this one. We move on to Monolith in 1979, a big letdown from the previous two records for me. Didn't like this one nearly as, as much as the first two, or the previous two, excuse me, which are their two most popular records. Monolith definitely less proggy than Left Overture and Point of No Return. Um... The best thing I can say about this record, honestly, was I like the guitar riff on a track called Stay Out of Trouble. I thought it was maybe the worst album I've heard by the band so far. I probably like the first three records a bit more. This one did nothing for me, to be honest. We move on to 1980 with Audio Visions. Did not like it. Uh, I like the guitar riff on a track called Loner. Maybe the best thing I can say about my feelings on the album. Uh, no One Together... The early Genesis style is back, but it sounds more generic than it sounded on Left Overture and Point of No Return. I did not like this album. Um, they get better in 1982 on Vinyl Confessions. Uh, much stronger than the previous two albums. It is a generic sound. I don't really care for the vocals on the record, but it, it just it's a big improvement on, on the previous two records. Uh, Crossfire that was, sounds that a was lot like album. a Sticks. That was the first album that Elefante replaced Steve Walsh. Oh, with okay. Vocals on. Interesting. Uh, I try to remember the names. I know there was some conflict, some religious conflict with this band between Steve Walsh and Carrie Livgren, uh, which I thought was interesting. Uh, I don't think that should ever, in my opinion, it shouldn't detract from like the unification of a band or the cohesion of a band. Um, but I, apparently it bothered Steve Walsh that Steve, that Karen Livgren was going in so much of a Christian lyrical direction. And I guess it made him leave the band. I don't know, but, but crossfire on this record, it actually sounds a lot like a stick song, the riff on the track. I just noticed that, uh, I'll get into this in my little wrap up, uh, about sticks, Kansas connection. Cause this is interesting. Um, play the game tonight. The, okay. I'm going to give Kansas some props here. Play the game tonight. Pretty good track. Also, the vocal melody on it reminded me a lot, a lot. And go back and listen to this, Jim. You'll hear it. Reminded me a lot of Send Her My Love by Journey. But interestingly enough, this album came a year before Journey Frontiers, which was the album that Send Her My Love was on. I like Send Her My Love, by the way. I think it's a good, really good song for, it's not, you know, my style, but I think it's a great song. But it's interesting. I think Journey might have borrowed it a little bit from that song, Play the Game Tonight. Listen to the vocal melody on those, on those songs on Play the Game Tonight. Then listen to Send Her My Love. This is really geeky stuff, but, you know, sometimes when you have OCD, you hear it that other people don't hear. I heard it. Uh, we we're going to move on to Drastic Measures, 1983. Not nearly as good as Vinyl Confessions. Um, fight Fire with Fire. Not as good as Metallica, Fight by fire of fire not as good but it probably was the best song on the record uh it sounded kind of like survivor on steroids i don't know it didn't i just didn't connect with this record to be honest with you uh vinyl confessions was definitely better 
I don't know why. Now we move on to the Steve Moore Serum, uh, 1986 with Power. And uh, Steve Morris is definitely the best musician, I think, that has ever in the band. You you know more about Steve Morris than I do, and I actually learned some things about him from you. Uh, I believe he's played with Deep Purple as well. Um, and so he's a really well-versed. He's kind of like a jack-of-all-trades kind of guitar player, highly technical player. Um, you can tell he's a great player with great chops on this record. Um, I kind of like Power. I You know, it wasn't as good as... Um, I probably liked it more than Vinyl Confessions, but not as much as Left Overture and A Point of No Return. It was still a bit of a kind of a generic sign, generic sounding album, um, but the guitar work was really good. Not high on Steve Walsh's vocals on this record. Uh, my favorite track on the record actually was Musicato, which was an instrumental. That was my favorite track on the record. Uh, I thought Power was okay, um, but not the level of their best material and probably not as good as Vinyl Confessions. Next, we come to In the Spirit of Things, 1988, which is a loose concept album. So Wicca told me. Um, I like this one much more than Power. Maybe it's because it was a concept album or a loose concept album. Uh, I like Bells of St. James quite a bit. I, that was my favorite track on the record. Um, I also like Ghost as well. And interestingly enough, the vocals on Ghost were some of the best vocals I've ever heard on a Kansas track. I like the vocals on that track. Overall, uh, an improvement on power, probably the third best record I've heard by the band of the state, uh, other than their two most popular records. We move on to Freaks of Nature in 1995. Um, eh, kind of feel like this one was kind of like power, you know, I, I can take it or leave it. Um, the keyboard part on Desperate Times, I believe, was the song that I wrote down. Interesting that the keyboard part on that sounded a lot like Love, Rain Over Me by The Who, but sped up. Listen to that, Jim. I think you'll hear it. Um, the title track, Desperate Times. Um, actually, no. I think I picked the wrong song there. I want to apologize to all the Kansas fans out there. That was Desperate Times. Maybe it was Desperate Times. There's a track on this record that sounds a lot like Love, Rain Over Me, kind of sped up, the keyboard part of the song. Uh I'm not sure what song it was. I don't want to quote that on, but Desperate Times, which was the title track, was definitely the, the heaviest song on the record and the best song on the record. Kansas is probably better when they play a little heavy, I think. Um, and they play pretty heavy on this record. And I don't know what song that keyboard part is on, Jim, but that keyboard part on one of these songs just reminds me of Love Rain Over Me quite a bit. It's not a lift or anything. It's not like they copied it. It just reminds me of it. Um, albums never the same. 1998, the worst record in their catalog thus far, without any question. I did not like this record. Uh, kind of it was a cover album of their own songs. Well, it, they, they did something with the London Symphony Orchestra. This is yeah. unlistenable to me. This reminds me of the kind of things that Yes would do with these symphonies and stuff. And I, look, I, I don't, I like Yes more than Kansas. Um, I don't like them nearly as much as Genesis or King Crimson or Rush, but I do like Yes, especially Fragile. Fragile is like definitely their best record. I'm not huge on Yes. Um, definitely lower on the totem pole for me than, than early Genesis, Rush, and King Crimson. But they're, they're pretty good. They can play. But this kind of reminded me of what Yes would do on those symphony records. I used to see these like in, you know, the old record stores, the mainstream record. Oh, Yes, playing with a London symphony, you know. Oh, oh. then you listen to it. It's like, what is this? It is I don't like when bands do this, I guess. And I don't like when Metallica, you know, plays with symphonies and, you know, or whatever. And I, I like it when the band, any band, when they kind of bring in players that, you know, that add textures to the sound. I'm going to use Susie and the Banshees in, as an example, as a band that did this really well. Uh, sorry, I had to bring it up. When Martin McCarrick came in and added textures to Peep Show in 1988, it was completely natural. He became part of the band and it worked beautifully. But when all these other bands, I could go from Yes to Metallica, whoever else, they bring in, you know, these symphonies and things. It just, I don't know, man, it's overblown. I hated this record. Worse than their catalog. Let's move on to 2000. We're almost done, Jim. We're almost done. Somewhere to Elsewhere. <sighs> Interesting. This was a very bluesy record for Kansas. That was the one thing that, I noticed on this record, I didn't really like it. 
Um, I think I liked the first three more when they had more of like a Southern rock influence on, on, on the albums. This one was more just like straight up, like a lot of straight up blues stuff on the record. And uh, I liked it better than the one before it, but it might be my second least favorite in the catalog, to be honest. We move on to the last two. And in like 2016, we have the Prelude Implicit. That's a title for you. Um, average. Uh, a lot better than Somewhere to Elsewhere or the Symphony album, for sure. But, you know, definitely not, you know, it, it, it doesn't stand up to Left Overture or Point of No Return, which, again, I don't think are masterpieces, but are strong records. Uh, it doesn't stand up to those. I, I don't like it as much as like the Steve Morse era stuff either, to be honest. Last record, The Absence of Presence. I got through it, man. Um, 2020. So this was released pretty recently. Uh, based on the one song that I could hear, uh, which was the title track, I think this album was better than anything they've done since 1988 with Steve Morse. My overall feeling on Kansas, and again, uh, folks, Jim in particular, um, this is a band I really knew nothing about. I think you knew more about them than I did. Um, I think they're mediocre. Uh, you know, this is obviously a subjective show, so everyone understand, take this with a grain of salt. This is for fun. This is an exercise in, uh, you might say, pretense, knowledge, extemporaneous speech, and the love and passion of music. But I do, I do find this band to be, you know, kind of a mediocre band. Um, they're, they're, they're not as good as the Allman Brothers. No way. I, you know, I'm not a huge Allman Brothers fan, but I respect that early. Allman Brothers sound with a dual guitar lead thing of Dickie Betts and Dwayne Allman, that stuff's fantastic. It's like free jazz with Coltrane and Miles Davis. They don't, this band doesn't have that kind of musicianship. They're good, but it's kind of mediocre to me overall. Their two best records are their most popular records, Left Overture and A Point in No Return. Um, Would you Dustin consider Lee, adding those to your collection, collection if you came across them? I don't hate them by any means. I don't hate them. Uh, but I don't like them. They're just kind of mediocre. They rely on Genesis, early Genesis, a little bit too much, I think, throughout their catalog, uh, especially in the 70s. Um, there are lots of bands I dislike, you know, a lot more. I don't dislike them at all. I just find them to be average. And the one thing I found from this listening experience was I appreciate the band Sticks. Now more than ever, I think Sticks is much better than Kansas. They were two bands that I always kind of equated as, you know, kind of the same sound. I think Sticks is a lot better, um, especially when Dennis DeYoung is singing. I like Dennis DeYoung's vocals, actually. And um, I think the Dennis DeLung songs that, that he sang with Sticks are just a lot better than the Steve Walsh songs with uh, Kansas, even the popular Steve Walsh songs. So... That's my review, Jim. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm down to listen to you. I did. That was great. Thanks, uh, Luddite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, a lot of stuff we agree on, a lot of stuff we disagree on, um, and we'll get into that. I, my first experience with Kansas was a lot like yours. You know, I remember hearing "Dust on the Wind" and the, "Dust in the Wind" on the, on the radio and uh, Carry On Wayward Son on the radio and just kind of fell in love with both those songs. You know, just hearing them on the radio in the car with my parents, much like you did. That's, that's uh, how I first heard them too, man, yeah. Specific places hearing them, but those were two well-played or much-played songs on 70s radio and, and still are, you know, on classic rock They're radio. Loving. I, you know, I'm going to interject for just one second and let, let you roll with it, dude. But I saw one thing about Carry On My Wayward Son. It was like the second most popular song on classic rock radio in, I don't know what year it was. It wasn't that far back, maybe 2000 or something, or 1998, yeah. I don't remember the year, but it is the second, it was the second most popular song on classic rock radio. I mean, it was more popular than Cashmere. It was more yeah. popular than, I don't know, Light My Fire. It was more popular than Satisfaction. I don't, you can go on and on and on. That's it's incredible if you think about it. Yeah, yeah, they they've certainly sold a lot of music over the years. Yeah, they that's did. for sure. Um, it, my first experience actually owning was I remember going to Swallens on East Main Street with 
my um, money that I'd made for, you know, doing chores around the house and stuff like that. And knowing those two songs, I saw an album there, Two for the Show, their live album from 1978. This was probably 79. I bought it. I was 11, 12 years old, something like that. And uh, but I remember buying that album and listening to it and really liking those two songs, never really given the rest of it much of a chance at 11, 12 years old. And then we progress. I get into high school, you know, still hear these Kansas songs on the radio and, you know, point of no return and and fight fire with fire, carry on wayward son, you know, all those songs. And um, I, I, that was my metalhead years, where unless it was Priest or Maiden or I remember we, I remember you with those I remember you in Ozzy, biology you know, class, Pasca, biology class, Doctor Faust. What was it, Doctor Faust? It was Mister Faust. And Frank Faust. Zappa, throw Frank Zappa in there, and yep. uh, you know, other than than Zappa, it was pretty much strictly heavy metal stuff that I listened to, and never really considered myself much of a. Uh, a prog nerd even you know going throughout life you know i always thought of bands like king crimson and kansas and and um you know you know i liked rush i like sticks so there was some kick crossovers into the the prog side but your king crimson's your old genesis your your gentle giants bands like yeah, that i knew about those bands in high school i never never what really understood them you know i i'm i'm talking 40 50 year old me i never really understood that music and never really got into it a whole lot um with watching some sea of tranquility another great show here on youtube i love I, sea of tranquility back into prog a lot and uh become a prog nerd and uh you know started exploring some of these bands so when this when we thought of this this topic kansas is one of the first ones i wanted to do you know the the great american prog band and and kind of go from there and i was I think I was probably a little bit more impressed with their catalog than it sounds like you were. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember when I bought that two for the show album, I was, I was kind of scared of them. You know, the, the rich Williams with the eye patch and uh, Robbie Steinhardt, the violin player with the, the big Afro. And, you know, I thought these guys were like pirates from Kansas or something <laughs> and was, was a little scared of, of the band. But um, listening to them here over the last week, I've I got to be honest with you. I've really fallen in love with this band, um, and I've you know been fortunate enough to find some used CDs here of theirs over the past month. And uh, Left Overture was the first one I found that kind of led me to think, you know, hey, we should do this for our, our first topic. Um, the the first album that, that debut. It, it, one place one point we're in disagreement is I think it's a fantastic debut. Um, it's got that real boogie woogie sound to it, that Southern rock sound, like you said, um, very Almond Brothers ish, Leonard Skinner ish. Um, the first song, Can I Tell You, that, that song is a real rocker on there. I really enjoyed that song. Uh, I think it's the second song, Bringing It Back. That's a JJ Kale cover, which I didn't know until like yesterday that that was a JJ Kale cover. I'd heard that song several times by Kansas and, um, Every time I hear it, I think of the Pete Townsend song, Face to Face. Interesting. Face yeah. to Face, because it's got that same little guitar riff at the beginning. And um, then it's got the some of the, the more epic songs, The Journey from Mary Abron, Aperku, if I, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, um, Death of Mother Nature, um, Death of Mother Nature Sweet, sorry. And I really like the sound of the violin. On this album, Robbie Steinhardt, and I've fallen in love with his vocals, too, over the course of listening to their catalog. Walsh is a, is a great vocalist, but I really like Robbie Steinhardt's vocals on some of the songs. We'll get into that more here later. But his violin on that first album reminds me of a lot of Charlie Daniels band type stuff, almost, uh, with the, the violin on, on there. I heard, you know what? I'm going to interject. I heard, a I heard a little bit of Charlie Daniels too. I didn't want to say it because I thought, well, I heard it a little bit. Okay. I heard like yeah. more of an Almond Brothers and I heard a little Boyster Cult for yeah. some reason, like early, like Blue Oyster Cult debut kind of era. But I heard a little hint of Charlie Daniels too. You're right. And I rated, I rated that, that uh, debut album a solid eight and a half out of 10. Wow. But, okay. Uh -huh. I'll say this. I thought it was average, but it was a lot better than the Rush debut. Yeah. <laughs> And I like Rush a lot more than Kansas. Okay, uh, Rush is one of my favorite bands, but their Song debut for, is not good. Yeah, yeah, I, I like it. Rush. It's my second favorite album in their catalog, 
which we'll wow get okay that's the one i one of them that i don't own that if i see it somewhere i'm gonna grab it okay. whether it's in vinyl or cd so song for america their second one um i think takes a little more proggier turn from the the boogie woogie even though there was a lot of prog on that first album is uh, the boogie woogie sound starts to decrease a little bit i really like down the road with uh, steinhardt singing that one and the one you didn't like, Song for America, the title track, I, I love that song. I think that's a, a great, uh, word, or, or not necessarily orchestral, but just a, it's got a big epic sound to it. Um, Mask, I think is a little bit of a drop off from Song for America, which I gave the Kansas album eight and a half, Song for America I gave eight, Mask I rate as a seven. Um, Icarus stood out to me on Mask and The Pinnacle, two songs that I did really like off that one. Boy, Mysteries of Mayhem was definitely my favorite song on Mask by, by Light Years. That's, that's a good song as well. Uh, Left Overture, uh, I'm with you. I think that's the best in their catalog. I gave that a, a, sure. a, a nine. Um, Carry On Her Wayward Son, The Wall's a great song, Miracles Out of Nowhere, Magnum Opus. Out of Nowhere for sure, good song. Fantastic songs. Point of No Return, great album again. I don't think it's as good as their debut or Left Overture, but I had that a solid third in my catalog. Um, what do you it, think about Lightning's Hand? That's that's the, definitely my favorite song on that record. Uh, Lightning's Hand's a good one. I didn't have. I noted a couple here that I liked. Portrait he knew that you mentioned. I really liked that song. Of course, Dust in the Wind and the title track. Paradox was another one I really liked off of that. Yep, we have Portrait, it, Portrait He Knew was the one that reminded me of Back in New York City by Genesis on yeah. The Lamb a little bit. So This this album, they you saw them kind of shorter songs. You know, you, there wasn't the seven, eight, nine minute songs like they'd had in the past. It was, you know, more your four minute songs, maybe five minutes stretching a little bit, but shorter songs on this album. Then you had the two for the show, the live album in 78, which is, if you haven't ex explored that yet at all, I think that's a fantastic live album. Okay, yeah. I, that's, I, just, went, just, I just listened to the studio. Their early, early catalog on it. And what is that? One, two, three, four, five. So the first five albums of Monolith. Yeah, it, it's still shorter songs. I didn't care for it as much as the, the, the first five. No, it was, it was definitely. I, thought, I agree. Yeah, I thought that was a little bit of a drop off. Uh, I did like People of the South Wind on that. I enjoyed that song a lot. Um, Audio Visions, yet another little bit of a drop off from Monolith, even. Um, Agree. And yeah, the, the song Hold On, Livgren's overtly Christian lyrics in there and everything did cause a lot of dissension in the band. Um, Livgren and, and Walsh were, I read, were little distance from this album from their their respective solo careers too and of course those what is that seven albums those first seven studio albums all had the same lineup steve walsh on keys and vocals live carrie livgren on guitars keys background vocals robbie steinhardt violin and vocals rich williams who i think is a fantastic guitar player and after listening to this catalog i think he may be one of the most underrated guitar players ever uh, wow. a lot of, a lot that's of my praise. You play guitar, so very technically proficient. I do hear a lot of uh, jazz influences in there, and um, I, I think he's a, a very versatile gu guitar player that uh, probably hasn't been given enough credit over the years. Dave Hope on bass and and Phil Ehart on drums. And is Dave Hope his real name? I'm just curious. I don't know because I, I think he was the one. If I read right, was he the one who went on to produce like Petra? Um, one of those guys, maybe it wasn't Dave Hope. I don't, okay. I'm not, I that just read this. Elefante. I it did a, like a wicked Elefante. overview and kind of skimmed it. And one of the guys, not surprisingly, and I, I feel like it was the bass player who went on, maybe it wasn't the bass player, but one of those guys went on to produce like a Petra album. You remember Petra, yeah. right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'll have, like, to, I'll have to look that up. And if anyone knows, put that in the comments. Yeah, but t tell us because I just that is. let us know. Because we knew Petra in high school, we knew Striper, and I mean, we you know we 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 were you know acclimated to all this stuff. But I don't yeah. remember any of it at all. But I know Petra was very popular with a lot of yeah. people, and it was interesting that one 
one member of Kansas, I can't remember which one it was, did go on, I think, to produce a Petra record. So, yeah, let us know. We're naive on that. At least, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have brought it up. But anyway. That's all right. Yeah. Vinyl Confessions comes next in the catalog, 1982. Walsh was replaced by John Elefante for this album um, after his uh, split from uh, Livgren and their differences, which... You know, apparently they got over because they got back together some. So, um, and if you haven't seen the movie Miracles from Nowhere, which is the Kansas documentary, very good, very good movie. Really, what year was it? Uh, twenty fourteen, I think. Oh, later. Okay. Yep, yep. It was it was fairly recent that that was done. So, does it go into all the religious dissent and stuff like that? Or I'm sorry, does it go into all like the dissent, like between Steve Walsh and Carrie Livgren and? Yep. Okay, yeah, I, I want to check that, that out because that, that kind of stuff is intriguing to me. Yeah, Vinyl Confessions I had rated lower on my list. And, and let me let me say that when I say it's lower on my list, I loved all these albums. I thought they were all good albums. Nothing received lower than a, than a five out of ten stars wow. and, okay. or five out of ten on my, my list. Uh, Vinyl Confessions, I did have it a six. Wasn't my favorite. Wasn't my least favorite. Um Play the Game Tonight, I think, was the highlight of that album. Yeah, great, great song. And again, it, it really reminds me a lot of Sin for My Love by Journey. But yeah. I, if anyone, Journey was influenced by Kansas on that song. Yeah. So, there you go. Yep. Uh, Drastic Measures comes next in 1983. And no Steinhardt on this album. He was a little tired of the lyrics from um, Audio Visions and Vinyl Confessions being used that Livgren had written being used in like Christian tracks and uh, he was upset about the Christian leaning of the band and uh, kind of left the band here so I I think this album dreadfully missed the violin um, I, I had this rated as as the lowest rated album in their catalog for me fight fire with fire is a decent song but that was I, the best song of the record I think yeah uh, I, I I just I didn't care I, I hate to say i didn't care for it because like i said it's still got it's still a good album but this was my least favorite of their albums uh power came a few years later and yes they added steve morris who was you know long of the steve morris band and the dixie dregs and and uh, had done a lot of fusion more fusion-y stuff over the years um Great guitar player, and I think this is the best of the, the two albums. I know you like the other one better, but I think this is the better of the two. With you like um, this, you like this more than in the spirit of things. I do. Oh, I didn't. I definitely. I, I gave in the spirit of things. I think it might be their might be their third best record. Yeah. Overall. Like I, I gave it like a seven out of ten, and I gave um, the two best known ones, uh, Leftover Turn and Point in Return. Each an eight out of ten. Okay. Uh, I liked in the spirit of things. I, I I appreciate what they were going for on it. I gave it a yeah. seven out of ten. I like the guitar work. A couple of tracks I really like. Bell and St. James Ghost. It just it did. I didn't like the production on it, but I like what they were going for. Mm -hmm. Power did return Steve Walsh to the band, um, and added uh, Mr. Greer on bass. Billy Greer. I can't remember what his first name is. But um, I really liked his, yeah, Billy Greer, I really liked his bass playing on this album. And uh, he became one of the, the principal songwriters for the band, too. You know, once Livgren had left on this album and, and Greer kind of filled a little bit of that void from the songwriting end. So I, I think that was a good addition from there. I don't know what happened to Dave Hope. He did come back and play for him on one of their later albums. So um, I like the sound of, of this album, just the overall sound of it. It's, it's still got that sort of mid 80s overproduced sound um but but I, I like the sound of the album uh and of course the steve morris guitar on that's terrific uh in the spirit of things again i i, I liked it less than power but still I, I gave it gave it a six uh and power i think i gave a six and a half to okay. so there's not not a whole lot of difference there i, I still miss the violin on this even though, you know, Morse replaces some of that violin on those two albums with his guitar playing. Um, then there was a period where the band didn't do much. They did have a couple compilations, a live album in there. And then 1995, you go to the Freaks of Nature. Uh, they promoted this album by touring with their Al Alan Parsons project. They actually opened for Sticks on this tour. Ooh, to the album. opened up for Sticks, okay. Yep. 
this is this is their heaviest album. Um, I, I rated this one higher than any of the the two Morris albums. Interesting. Uh, Steve, Steve or uh, Rich Williams was the only guitar player on this album, and I thought he just did a terrific job carrying it. Uh, e Hart still on drums, Walsh on vocals and keys, Billy Greer on bass. They added Greg Robert for some uh, keys, and they brought in David Ragsdale to play the violin. Uh, so I had my violin back on this one. I, I was happy again. Um, I like violin too. A lot of a lot of more world rhythms on this. Even though this was their heaviest album, I think the song Need, great violin in that song, by the way. I Can Fly, they both had some world rhythms in there. And uh, the song Freaks of Nature is a, is a, it's a blues rock song. You know, you, I think you said this was their, maybe their bluesiest album. No, I, I think that one would be uh, the one from, the one, at least the one from um, Somewhere to Elsewhere from 2000. Yeah. Always never the same. I, I didn't really rate it as far as anything because I, I just considered that sort of a one-off, a covers album almost. Even though there's a few new songs on it, I didn't spend a whole lot of time with that. Um, somewhere to somewhere to elsewhere. That along with Drastic Measures are probably my two least favorite in the catalog. Um, but it is a return to the original lineup. One thing I did forget to say: if we go back to um, Freaks of Nature that we, we both kind of like this album. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think Freaks of Freak. I would rate Freaks of Nature. Uh, I would agree that it's their heaviest record, and I probably like it as about as much as the first three. Um, yeah. But I, I I would say I liked In the Spirit of Things more. But it was yeah. one of the better ones. Uh, Freaks of Nature, I think, is Walsh's worst vocal record. I don't know if he was, you know, having some throat issues. He, he sounded a little. Age might have been kicking in, although he does sound better on some of their later ones uh, after that. But I, I think that's probably his worst vocal performance on Freaks of Nature. Still didn't distract me from liking it. I still think it's a great album. Um, okay. Somewhere somewhere to Elsewhere is Return to the Original Lineup, plus Billy Greer. Dave Hope played bass on two songs, Billy Greer on the other six or seven songs. Um, this is Walsh's last album with him. Um, and he only does vocals, no keyboards from Walsh on this album. And it's also uh, Mr. Steinhardt's last album. He came back to, to do this one in his last album with him. Um, like I said, I gave uh, somewhere to elsewhere a five out of ten. Prelude Implicit 2016. Haven't spent a whole lot of time with it. I do like Ronnie Platt's vocals uh, and uh, Zach Risby. Uh, they added him on on some guitar, and he also handles a lot of the songwriting as well. Uh, seems like a, a great musician from what I've heard. And Ronnie Platt's vocals, I like. Probably more than Elefante's, less than Steinhardt or Walsh's. So let me, th this, th the last two records, uh -huh. correct me if I'm wrong, it's th the Kansas Banner with a couple of the original musicians. Williams, Williams and Ehart. But it's, it's not Carrie Livgren and it's not Steve Walsh. I want, is it the drummer, right? The drummer? Yeah, Phil Ehart on drums and Rich Williams on guitar. Okay, so it is two original but, members. Those two have been on every Kansas record. Wow, okay. Williams and Ehart. Kind of like Robert Fripp or something, you know, being on yeah. Crimson Records. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I gave both those last two, Prelude Implicit and Absence of President, a six and a half. Um, they saw David Ragsdale back on violin on both those albums. So I had my violin once again. But overall, it sounds like maybe I like the catalog a little bit better than you. I don't think there's a, a what I would consider a bad album in it. I think there's some mediocre albums uh, some that i like more than others um if i had to pick a favorite album i think it would be left overture with the the can the debut the kansas album a close second uh, i just i like the sound of that um that that first album a lot so hopefully we've both learned some stuff on this i learned a lot and left overture was definitely my favorite album i will give it an eight out of ten i i can totally see why people love it so much mm -hmm. i i get it um i mean pretty good musicianship not as good as genesis but early genesis probably as good as phil collins led genesis yeah if, probably better but it's you know it's not it's not steve hackett peter gabriel it's not the level of genesis around that time but it's really good and 
I see why people love that record, and yeah. I, I liked it. It's an 8 out of 10. Point in the return, probably an 8 out of 10 as well. Uh, those are definitely two, two favorite records of the catalog. And then third, um, for me, it was definitely uh, in the spirit of things, for, for sure. Okay. It was probably my third favorite. Uh, but I did like the first three records, and mm -hmm. I appreciate what their fusion of, you know, kind of a gritty Americana style of hard rock with a little – southern rock influence mixed with that you know classic early genesis progressive sound i appreciated the fusion and they did do something very different but i did come away with, with listening to the catalog finding that that sticks for me i didn't know this until i listened to the catalog that sticks is i, I do prefer sticks music and i don't want any of the kansas people to come at me or anything you know because this is all subjective you know it, it, this is all totally subjective and there will probably be times when uh jimmy duster you know when I bring a band to the forefront and he crit critiques them in a way that I'm critiquing Kansas. But I also want to mention before Kansas, again, I didn't dislike this band at all. I thought they were very mediocre. Um, there were plenty of the cr bands that critical, the critics love that I'm not high on that. I like dislike much more than Kansas, a band like Elvis Costello, for example, don't get Elvis Costello at all. The critics love Elvis Costello. Can't stand Elvis Costello. Sorry, Elvis. Um, there's a number of bands like that are critical darlings that I'm not high on, and I like Kansas a lot more than those bands. So it's not like, you know, I'm being like a music snob here or anything by any means. I'm just he hearing what I hear. We like and what we like. Yeah, yeah I, I find it to be a mediocre catalog. The two most popular records for me were the best. Um, but they're good. They can definitely play their instruments for sure. And I learned a lot by listening to the music, and I learned about, you know, things like – you know, religious conflicts within bands, which I didn't know about any of this stuff. I didn't even know they had Christian leanings. So, yeah. you know, I learned a lot, and it was a very uh, interesting exercise for sure, and I'm, I'm glad we undertook this with Kansas. Yeah. Yeah, looking forward to some more. I just wanted to share. I picked up uh, Left Overture here. I uh, saw it on sale about a month ago at uh, Laser's Edge CD. Great place to buy CDs online, too, by the way. Oh, you bought it online? Uh, yep. Um, company called Laser's Edge. And I saw this and I'm like, ah, you know what? I should probably get that album. But this is kind of the one that led me to start thinking about this as our first topic. And then the other day, this past week, after going through listening to these albums on YouTube and Spotify and anywhere else I could over the past week, I was in a half price bookstore here locally and ran across Point of No Return that I added to my collection. I like that album cover, by the way. By the way, I really like the, the album cover for Point of the Return. It's a great cover. Yeah. Is it supposed to represent like Magellan or something like, you know, circumnavigating the world? Or? You know, I forget. They, they talk about that in the movie, and they also talk about that uh, uh, album cover on the first album, too, the one that you didn't care for. I didn't like that. Oh, I hated that first album cover. That was the worst cover for sure. They, they, they talk about that and how that was created, and they came up with that and everything. You got to watch that Do you that know what movie. the first – do you know what I the first cover Monolith. Okay. 1979. So we'll talk about Monolith. Let me see the cover for Monolith. Okay, that's what I remember. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I would pick up if I come across the debut somewhere, like I said, on vinyl or, or CD, I would definitely pick that one up. The the debut album cover, again, I thought that was a, a decent debut. Again. I liked it a lot more than the Rush debut, and I like Rush a lot more, but as a debut, was a better record. Now, the cover, for whatever re reason, it reminded me of Caress of Steel by Rush, yeah. which is an awful cover. I, I'm, I, is that like a wizard standing on a cliff or something in Caress of Steel with a crystal ball? Or, and it's like green and gold and just kind of murky, and it, th uh -huh. that cover just kind of reminded me of that. And, you know, I'm a real sucker for aesthetic, the aesthetic, and – it just it bothered me that that debut cover. I'm sorry, I don't know what it was. <laughs> watch the movie. It, it'll, okay. uh, it'll make 2014. It'll make more sense I will watch that. Yeah, called Miracles Out of Nowhere. I was the bad guy today. I'm sorry, folks. I, so uh, I don't want the Kansas people coming at me, man. Cause I, I I I hear they're I can hear they're, they're excellent musicians. And um, but the big thing that I took away from it is I did. I hate to say it, but I came away appreciating Sticks music a little more. Um, yeah. I said it. Oh, no. Sorry. Well, maybe we'll do the uh, other 
popular American prog band. Uh, sticks. I'll do sticks. Sticker, I'll so. do sticks. I've uh, been exploring their catalog a little bit myself, some of their back catalog. So it might be a future episode for us. So thanks okay. for joining us today, everyone. Um, we uh, we have enjoyed doing this. Uh, we're going to, like we said, we're going to be back with the Doors next week. And Jeff has his Doors album there to hold up. This is their best cover, Looking by the forward way. forward to that. Uh, we got our 1988 prog metal concept album battle we might uh, bring in dr kelly for that you might maybe, need to bring in dr kelly for that one might have to do that got our uh sticks for the sometime in the future there and um like to do a gentle giant in there at some point now that's interesting because i that is a band they're they're a very beloved band yeah and um i know nothing about them zero and i i know that in prog circles they're really respected they're you know, they're not as popular as like Yes or Genesis or, you know, even King Crimson, but they're really respected. And yeah. I think that would be a good idea. Um, um, yeah, I'm down for anything, man. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll review anything. I don't, I don't care. I'll, I'll, I'll review, I'll, next, I'll review a poison record. Down, so. Good catching up with my friend from uh, the Northwest there. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Make sure you like and subscribe to this channel and uh, hit the bell button to get notified of any new videos we post. And uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. The doors next week, folks. Tune in. Thanks, Jim.